our own fellowship who are not able to be with us because of infirmity tonight. We're very desirous that you be blessed. This will be our 35th lesson in the book of Amos, 35th exposition of the book of Amos. We're going to be in the 6th chapter, verses 3 through 6. Now, in uh, the entire ministry of Amos, as well as several other of the prophets, we're being exposed to, the, to a spiritually fallen state. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, as confirmed in Adam and Eve, the fallen state can be induced by a single transgression. It's not necessarily the result of a whole series of transgression. By transgression, Adam fell, and the whole race with him. In the days of Noah, the whole world descended into a quagmire of iniquity without having received any law from God, and they were duly punished for it, because it exceeded any tolerable boundaries. The only law they had was the law of conscience. What they did have that. Sodom and in Sodom and the cities of the plain, they were destroyed because they violated the law of nature and went beyond the bounds of allowed by nature. Now in Israel and they had no written code either, Sodom. Now in Israel we're exposed to a people that were chosen by God, favored by God, delivered by God, led by God, fed by God, caused a triumph by God. And they were given a moral code that told them how God expects men to behave themselves. And it was a binding code. It didn't allow for any kind of infraction at all. And Israel was a favorite people of God. They were favored above all others on the face of the earth. I'm talking about the fallen state now. And as you progress through history, each example of fallen state, they had more to work with than the preceding people that fell. Of no other people in the flesh, in the flesh of no other people in the history of the world could this be said. They are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, whose are the fathers and of whom is concerning the flesh Christ came, whose overall God blessed forever. That has never been said of any other fleshly people or people of natural descent. So it's a very much of a unique privilege. Yet none of those benefits, there you go over them again, the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, the promises, and the fathers, and Christ's appearance on earth. None of those benefits had keeping power. Amen. You really got to see this now. Because there are all kinds of people today teaching laws, procedures, routines, rules that they say will keep you. They're lying. Amen. I don't think they're intentionally lying, but they're lying. If the things God gave people couldn't keep them, well, we don't need to comment any further on the impossibility of men. Men cannot be changed by outward blessing. This can't happen. They can't be changed by external divine benefits. 
we want them to be sure we're not against it, but they don't change. This has been demonstrated in history. No. Right teaching doesn't change anybody. Right. <clears throat> doesn't regenerate anybody. No. Even God being identified with the people doesn't change them as, it, as illustrated in Israel. <laughs> the things that's necessary in order for men to be accepted by God unreservedly is there has to be a savior. Mm -hmm. There has to be a divinely received remedy for sin. There has to be a new birth. There has to be a covenant that governs man's association with yes. God. There has to be an intercessor. There has to be a mediator through whom communication with God and divine acceptance can be sustained. Yeah. Now, of course, Israel had none of this. Mm -hmm. But their fallen condition still wasn't accepted. That's right. Amen. God never gave any man the luxury of saying, I couldn't help it. Mm -hmm. right. That answer satisfies some people. Mm -hmm. Not God. Ow. Amen. <coughs> good? Yes. Just today I went through, I was curious about this. I went through and looked at different recovery programs. Yeah. And even the ones that mention God never mention Jesus. Actually, well, yeah. Never. Mm -hmm. yeah, they can find it to Christendom. See? Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> now, it's important that we learn, not intellectually learn, experientially learn, <coughs> not to depend on what God gives us, but to depend on God himself. Amen. That's important to learn this. Yeah, and you may think that's easy to learn, right? Some people fall apart when they lose their possessions. <coughs> now I'll tell you that the impact that Babylon the Great has had has made what I've just said exceedingly difficult to grasp. There's hardly a churched person in the world that won't like draw back a little bit. They may, they may see the value of it, but it's just a little bit hazy. I don't think you will find a person that doesn't find this a little difficult to accept. The people of God will go through that and come to the point where they do. We're dealing with a fallen condition. We shouldn't expect God to talk kindly about it or to be tolerant of it or to hold out his long suffering because of it. A fallen condition is a serious, serious condition. Amen. Now, continuing in his word to them, Amos 6 3 through 6. <clears throat> Ye that put far away the evil day and cause the seat of violence to come near, that lie on beds of ivory and stretch themselves out upon their couches and eat lambs out of the flock and calves out of the midst of the stall, that chant to the sound of the viol and invent to themselves instruments of music like David, that drink wine in bowls and anoint themselves with chief ointments, but they are not grieved for the affliction of Joseph. Amen. This is God talking now. You want to listen up to it. There's a lot to be learned here in this uh, divine utterance. <coughs> Now when he says ye, that's a corporal word. God's indicting an entire body of people. All of Israel. 
he's speaking to them particularly as a people, even though not everybody in there had was fallen. But he addresses, he, this is something to see. See, people object when we talk about the condition of the church, modern church. They say, well, they're not all that way. Well, they weren't all this way either. There were some righteous people there, and God even mentions them in the book of Amos. But the majority of it was false. He addresses the whole thing, the whole nation, as, as a whole. Ye, the nation as a whole was corrupt, and they were at a point where a remnant couldn't change the condition. There's a remnant there, but that... That couldn't stall off this, this judgment. Sodom was considered entirely corrupt, but there was righteous Lot. He was there, but he wasn't enough to save Sodom. You know, the only hope was to him to get out of Sodom. All the men of Israel. All of the men over 20 years of age perished in the wilderness because they believed a false report about the promised land. Uh -huh. yeah, right. Everybody there wasn't wicked. Moses died during that time. Aaron and Miriam died during that time. And yet this, it was... 500, over 500 and about 502,000, half a million, half a million men died. And the only one of the, that number that didn't was Joshua and Caleb of that number of people, it, 20 years and upward. So I'm showing that there's a, God can reject an entire generation. And there's too many examples in Scripture to question this. And no one ever ought to say that isn't right, it isn't fair, and so forth. This is God that did it. Whether it's right or not is not even open to question. God's ways are righteous. It's righteous for God to reject an entire generation. Yes, amen. When Jesus ministered here, he rejected that generation. Even though there were some the disciples, there were some of it that were saved, but as a, as a whole, the generation was rejected. Oh, it's, a, it's startling to consider this. It's very important. The thing that comes to my mind is I don't want to be part of one of, one of these generations. I, I don't care who, if they're related to me or not. I don't want to be part of a rejected generation. Amen. This is Jerusalem as a whole was rejected, and so he said that if uh, he said to the faithful, get as soon as you see it's evident to you that the city's going to be overrun, get out of there. Because yeah. if you stay, you'll die. Get out, run for the mountains. And and they did it. History tells us they did. Now the Lord zeroes in on this particular people. The the nation of Israel, the ten tribes of Israel. And he speaks to them all. If the word doesn't apply to someone, they'll be able to sift it out. And they, But they won't ignore it. They'll say, well, I don't, want to, I don't want to fall in that category at all. Here's what he said. You, this generation, this whole nation of Israel... You put away the evil day. That is, you thrust it, try and get it as far away from it as you can. You don't let it come into your thoughts. Some of the versions of the versions say you put it far from the day of doom. You don't, you don't want to deal with anything like that. You put off the day of calamity. They don't. He doesn't mean they delay it. He's not saying they delay the day of calamity. He's saying they refuse to consider it. They put it away from them. They put off the evil day, the NIV says. They ignore the evil day. They put off all thought of the evil day, another version says. 
They dismiss any thought of an evil day. They think that a day of disaster is far away. Yeah, it may come, but there's a long way off. You refuse to believe a day of disaster will come. The Net Bible says, thinking uh, to defer the evil day, the Jerusalem Bible says, ward off any thought of woe. Just got to keep positive thoughts. Wash, push away all thought of punishment awaiting you. Don't think about that. See, that, that's what these people were doing. Disbelieving that a day of evil will come. Now we're in the midst of a, of a delineation of a woe. Yeah. Something God has determined. And he's not going to reverse it. Yes, for three transgressions, yea, four, and he's not going to repent of it. This punishment is going to be doled out. Yet there were people that didn't think it was. And they had prophets that told them it, it wouldn't happen. But God, they're going to reap. See, they've sown the wind. I've heard people say, sow to the wind. It doesn't say sow to the wind. It said they sowed the wind. They reaped a whirlwind. <laughs> That's what they were getting ready to reap. They were drowning themselves in the meantime in pleasure and ease and luxury. They're drowning themselves in those that made them dull about this coming disaster, enjoying the pleasure of sin for a season. <clears throat> Now, in Jeremiah's day, there were some false prophets. They saw that people didn't like this kind of message. And so here's what they had to say. Neither shall evil come upon us, neither shall we see sword nor famine. Jeremiah is just blowing smoke. This isn't going to happen. Why, we got the strongest army in the world. We have surveillance equipment. We're on top of everything. This can't happen to us. Sword and famine shall not be in this land, they said, Jeremiah 14, 15. What were they doing? Putting the day far from them, see. Choosing the sleep of death, as it's called in Psalm 13, 3. Now, <laughs> as the pillar and ground of the truth, that's what the church is, First. Timothy 3.15, as the pillar and ground of the truth, one of the responsibilities of the church is to apprise sinners of the consequences of their sin. Amen. I'll admit to you this is not a pleasant ministry, but it does have to be done. Amen. This is what John the Baptist, this is what he did. This was how he prepared people to meet the Lord. You've got to deal with this sin. It's got to be dealt with. You can't ignore it. And the church needs to be that dogmatic. Yeah. Amen. They need to tell sinners, you've got to repent. Or else. <laughs> now in our time, Satan has introduced a line of theology that makes people who have believed for a while kind of comfortable with the state. They say, yeah, there is an evil day coming, there is a, a punishment coming, but don't worry, folk. The, the church will be taken out before it happens, and we won't have to go through it. Huh? This is taught at about 90% of Christianity. This is taught. And people swallow it down. What does it do? Makes them put the day. <laughs> they don't worry about it because we're not going to be there. Well, of course, why would I worry about something I'm not even going to be here for it? So here, in our case, we've got a duplication of what happened in Israel. They're false prophets conceived of a theology that made people comfortable where they were at and made them just stop their ears to what Jeremiah and prophets like him were saying. And the same thing has happened uh, today. See, the scriptures warn us that you've got to prepare for the evil day. 
you have to put on the whole armor of God that having done all, you'll be able to stand in the evil day. It's coming. You personally will have an evil day, but see, there's a generation that will have an evil day. Judgment will come, and you've got to be prepared for it so that, so that you'll stand. The important thing is that you outlast the thing. <coughs> now, he says, you cause the seat of violence to come near. Seat, in this case, isn't like chair or pad. Seat is like throne. In other words, this throne is going to be invincible. This, this punishment is going to be something nobody's going to be able to resist or overthrow or neutralize. It's going to be a, a over, violence is going to dominate and overthrow. It'll be executed on earth like the, like the exploits of Nebuchadnezzar were, but it'll be managed from heaven. God can use, like, Russia, China, Iraq. Don't think for one moment this isn't, this can't be. Don't imagine for one moment that this can't be. It would be just like God to just bring down this nation in defeat by an Iraq. Just a very small compared to us. Just a, just, this wouldn't surprise me at all. This this type of thing could happen. The seat of violence. Because when God said says, this is the day. Yeah. It's a it's a throne of violence. Amen. It's just going to run rough shot. Just like when Nebuchadnezzar started his rule, God said he gave everything over to his hand. Nobody could nobody could withstand him. But see, there are all kind of American Christians who think we can withstand him. Give us the right to bear arms. Let us have a rifle in the home. We can, we'll do it. We'll do it. We'll do it. Well, all of this is very aggravating to God. In the meantime, while they put this, the thoughts of this far away, continued their sin, the cup of their iniquity was filling up. That's what God said of the Amorites. Their sin was not yet full. In other words, sin aggravates God. Yes, amen. And as it grows, God gets more aggravated, mm -hmm. more yeah. irritated, yeah. until finally yeah. his yeah. wrath breaks out. Yeah. This is why he warned them. He said, uh, Malachi said, you have wearied the Lord. Malachi 2.17. I think I know some people I could say that to. This is the condition in which it is said you cause God grief. Psalm 95:10. Or you brought trouble to God. Isaiah 1:14. Or you wearied God. Isaiah 7:13. Once God said to Jeremiah through Jeremiah I am weary with repenting. What a thought. I'm weary with repenting. I said I was going to do this. Somebody interceded and I held off. I'm bumped. I'm weary of relenting. I'm, I'm tired of holding off and changing my mind. I'm not going to do it anymore. The evil days, see? But they... The people were thrust at it from them. <clears throat> then he describes this evil day has been appointed. He's already told them. This has been appointed. This is coming. What are they doing? They're having a grand time in luxury, plush conditions that lie on beds of ivory and stretch themselves upon their couches and eat the lambs out of the flock and calves out of the midst of the stall that chant to the sound of the viol and invent to themselves instruments of music like David. They were just having a grand time. The Lord was blessing them. Everything was going well. The crops were coming in good. Flocks are multiplying. Look how God's blessed us. But uh, 
they forgot that whom's ever much is given much is required. You can't compare yourself with the world. Yes. Mm-hmm. You, you've been given too much to compare yourself with the world. Say, well, I'm a little bit, at least I'm not as bad as they are. No, you've got no right to make that comparison. Amen. You've been given too much. Let's look at this, what he says to them. You lay on beds of ivory. That's luxurious living by the leaders of the people who he had said before did they amass their funds by unfair taxation and taking from the poor and <laughs> and they had beds of ivory they laid on God admonished the people through Jeremiah O daughter of my people gird thee with sackcloth and wallow thyself in ashes make thee mourning as for an only son most bitter lamentation for the spoiler shall sudden come upon us were they wallowing in ashes? No. Were they weeping and lamenting because of what God said he was going to do? No. No, they were just having a grand old time, laying on beds of ivory and having a choice diets and gorging themselves, and things are just going along really well, as they say, honky-dory. Luxury has a way of doing that. Opulence. Having more than you really need. We're not saying you shouldn't have that thing. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is you got to be alert because they yes. tug at your heart. Amen. First thing you'll think you need them. That's right. When you start judging whether or not the Lord's approved of you with how much you have, you oh, made a mistake. Oh, yes, mm-hmm. right. Amen. Luxury has a way of distracting the mind. It does. I never was what you what you wouldn't call a wealthy person by some people's standards at any rate. But when I retired from the industrial world, I had a, a lot less, about one-tenth. My income was about one-tenth what it was before. And I wondered how my own reaction was going to be to it because I... But you know, we ended up, we had more than we did before. Yes. Amen. I'm telling you the truth. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And if I were to sit down and try and figure it out, it would take too long. It was a waste of time. I, I, I decided I, well, I've, I'm satisfied with less. Amen. Amen. But not all people are this way. I've seen this happen. I know, I know names of people this has happened to. Mm-hmm. When they got possessions... It took away their heart. Because yes. possessions aren't what they're cracked up to be. Amen. Beds of ivory aren't really what they cracked up uh-huh. to be. Yeah. <laughs> they say like the rich man did, Oh, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease. See, no child of God can afford to do that. Amen. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. See, the temporality of life escapes them. And you eat lambs out of the flock. What does that mean? Other versions read the uh, choice lambs and fattened lambs. Ordinarily, these were the lambs given to the Lord. You've got to know the history of Israel. Ordinarily, these young lambs were sacrificed to God, and and sometimes they'd be used at feasts. They were not your ordinary fare. (coughs) One time, well, we read of Jesus was a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. See, the word lamb acquaints us with sacrifice to God and so I gather what they were doing, they'd take these out, of the, these out of the flock, these lambs that should have been reserved for God, and they, they fed on them. Nice tender meat. And calves out of the midst of the stall, and it was the same with calves. They were associated with being offered to the Lord, calves. They were an integral part of the whole sacrificial system. God told Aaron, take thee a young calf for a sin offering. He said one time, the calves were... 
That's not the only thing they were used for, but that was the predominant thing they were used for. But the leaders, they ate the calves from the stall and didn't think about the sacrifice. It wasn't for a feast for somebody else. Either. They lost all sense. Now, God told Jeremiah one time about people that had feasts like this. I'd wait whether I should read this text or not, but I, I think I will read it. Jeremiah 16, 8 and 9. And do not enter into a house where there is fist feasting. Do not enter into a house where there is feasting and sit down to eat and drink. For this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Before your eyes and in your days I will bring an end to the sounds of joy and gladness and to the voices of bride and bridegroom in this place. What was he saying? Is wrong to go to a feast? He said, at this time it's not right. There's judgment about to be poured out and this is not the time for feasting. This is the time for fasting. What else do these people do? They they chant to the sound of the viol, or string, viol is a stringed instrument. Some other versions say they sing idly to the sound of stringed instruments. Basic Babylonian English, they make foolish songs to the sound of corded instruments. You make up wild songs at your parties. Who improvise to the music of a harp. And you sang trivial songs to the sound of a harp. Does God really pay attention to stuff like this? You know what chant means? The word chant is translated from the word that means to improvise carelessly, chant, stammer, chatter, speak contemptuously, just brainless talk. I've been impressed by some Christian songs I've heard that are like chatter. And I do say this with absolute disrespect. They sound like they were written by an idiot. But they're offered to God. Well, God's telling you, he sees that. These type of songs weren't accompanied by faith or by gratefulness, they were just chatter. Mm -hmm. Just chatter, that's all they were. And it didn't end with them, did it? They invent to themselves instruments of music, like David. Now other versions, some of them butch, really butcher this verse, but here's some good, good translations. Imagine that you're like David. <laughs> <laughs> you get up there with your guitar like you were like David on his heart. Come on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what he's saying. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh -huh. You fancy yourselves to be great musicians like David. Yeah. Yeah. You account themselves musicians like David. But most modern versions butcher this verse severely. They say, like David, they invent, invented for, for themselves instruments of music. It's, most of the versions read this way. But David didn't invent music instruments for himself. These people were wrong. They were called the musical instruments of God, mm -hmm. and David, they were made to praise therewith. Yeah, that's right. First Chronicles 23, 5. David didn't make musical instruments for casual strumming. Yeah, right. uh -huh. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. See, the Jews, they didn't know of anything that just wrapped up in your personal life. They, they, didn't, uh -huh. they didn't have anything like this. Right. We Americans have this. I mean, I understand that, but they didn't. Mm -hmm. Everything they did had to be for God. Amen. They couldn't have a picnic. Yeah. They had a feast where they recall some mighty deliverance or something like this. That's how their lives are ordered. They didn't have a vacation day. They had the Sabbath day to remember God. Yeah, yeah. See? Yeah. It wasn't like, see, it was a different society completely. 
and musical instruments David made them for the house of God. Amen. They weren't used for anything else. I would challenge anyone to find one of the psalms that sounded like chatter. That's right. Mm -hmm. God said previously in Amos, take away from me the noise of your songs. It was, it was, they were like chatter to him. They were pretentious. They were contrived by evil hearts. They're what I like to call moon and June songs, you know. Take me by the hand and lead me to the promised land, you know. And they, oh, yeah, I'm telling you the truth. They didn't have the weight of a thoughtful songwriter or hymn writer. Now, every modern song is not like that. I understand that, but most of them are. And we should learn from this, and this is a hard lesson to learn. Those who are musically gifted do well to devote themselves to God. Amen. Now, there have been great uh, historical mus musicians that played only for God. There have been men that had a sense of music. Like Isaac Watts, mm -hmm. yeah. Fanny Crosby. Mm -hmm. They knew how to take a thought yeah. and put it to music. Yeah. Uh -huh. I think one reason why music has fallen on hard times, mm -hmm. modern music, is there's no message that not there's a me, not a message being communicated of any substance, so the music kind of reflects the uh -huh. scattered thinking of the of the words. Well, often, uh, oftentimes, what's at least popularized, the the music is an attempt to compensate for the lack of substance of the message. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's right. So that one is looking for an, an emotional response. Mm -hmm. And it's not, but the, there, there's no real sound thought behind it. There's not, yeah. there's mm -hmm. not praise which is bringing forth that, that emotion. That's right. It's, it's empty, yeah. and anything can be empty, even even very well thought out songs can be empty if they oh, yes. do not speak with their their heart or, or sing with their heart, but to, to give something shallow to the Lord. Hmm. The, thing, the thing that we want to all pick up on is that God takes note of our music. Now, he took note of their music. Yes. We're saying here that God takes note of everything. That's yes. right. Yeah. 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 Um, the, this is a message that flesh is completely adverse to. It, but everything really, it comes from the Lord. It belongs to the Lord. I think of uh, uh, scriptures that Talk about the Lord calling for the wine and the corn that makes glad the hearts of men. And about uh, men delighting in the Lord. And there, there is satisfaction and pleasure in taking the things that, that even the necessary things that we have. And, and um, as we participate in them, having God first in them, not, not divorcing God from the things that He provides, uh -huh. right. serving Him with it, yeah. whatever He's put in our hand, whatever abilities He's given us, to be able to serve God with those things, it brings a sense of satisfaction yes, because there's there's reason in it, there's mm -hmm. purpose in it, there's an eternal aspect to it mm -hmm. that cannot be found whenever we take those things and use it to our own purposes yes. Amen. and to yes. pleasing our flesh yes. and to being self-serving rather than serving God. Amen. That's a perversion of what of what God gave it for. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. This is a kind of a sensitive area with with some people. But if God gives you an ability it's wrong to give it to the world. Yes. Amen. 
Now, if a person can't see that, they got some real problems, and we, we won't argue with people about this. But this is the way it is. And at some point, see, the church has not maintained spiritual stability. So if there are gifted people, they get gifted in the area of music, the church doesn't provide an outlet. They got to go to the world and the world can't teach you the Lord's songs. That's, it. That's the catch. It can't tell you how to put your heart into it. It can just talk with surface appearance and that sort of thing. So the, the, the church, see, they had musicians under the law. There were musicians that taught people to praise God. Asaph was one of them, and the sons of Asaph, and they were they'd be headed up some of these psalms. They had people who taught the people how to intelligently offer praise up to God, accompanied with instruments and playing them skillfully. But this, this is like unknown in our time. It's tragic. Whoever sees it should blaze the trail and restore it. The world be hanged. Yes? Music is a representative of of a, spirit, a spiritual condition, whether it be of an mm. individual or a church or a yeah. generation or, mm -hmm. a, or a culture, the, the type of music, uh, both the, the words and the, and the, the type of, of music itself and the melodies and harmonies and mm -hmm. rhythm and, and things, it's kind of representative it's of, uh, it, it shows, manifests a condition. Mm -hmm. And so you've mentioned before how that, um, like a, a culture that without, or a society without a written language, their music will be That's less right. sophisticated, That's less right. refined. Amen. So it kind, of, kind of represents the condition. So uh, say, same thing can be seen in, uh, is true of lit the literature produced by a generation or by a culture. Yeah. So music is kind of, it can be seen as one of the fruits be born out of people and so where you know where god works it produces a godly music amen and that uh, that makes me think of uh the music on the other side of the red sea that's right you know? and then also in contrast to that in in babylon they they couldn't sing they hung the hearts yep. mm -hmm. so there's a there's a lot to Yes. There's a lot that the music tells. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's an area of, you can you know derive a lot of fruit, fruitful thinking there. Now he continues showing their self-centeredness. He said, "You drink wine in bowls and anoint the, that drink wine in bowls and anoint themselves with the chief ointments." <laughs> now, see, they were in a condition they couldn't as. Jeremiah 6.15 says they couldn't blush. They, they should have been embarrassed to do anything in the name of the Lord. They should have been embarrassed to engage in any God-ordained feast or activity. They should have been embarrassed because of their moral condition. But they weren't. And say so you drink wine in bowls. Now some of the versions, I think, butcher this too, but... The New American Standard Bible, I think, has it right from sacrificial bowls. The NIV says, by the bowl full. God's Word Bible says, by the jug. Living Bible says, by the bucket full. Contemporary English says, all the wine you want. English Revised says, in fancy cups. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, but that stinks. Some commentators did see do see this that the bowls were the ones associated with the tabernacle and temple, and I give you the text where there were there were bowls that were made for the various sacrifices and things pertaining to the sacrifices and sprinkling of water and blood. There were various bowls designed for God's use, but they uh, they apparently drank wine from them like like Belshazzar did. 
I remember he had the gold, the gold and vessels of the Lord from the temple. He drank, and you remember what happened there. Yeah. See, it's when you take something that was designed for God and you use it for self-aggrandizement, that's sin. And it's a, it's a high-ranking sin. There's some things God didn't mean for you. He meant for him. He upbraided Israel and said, you do your pleasure on my day. Oh, yeah, he upbraided Brother Sabbath. You do your pleasure on my day. Use my day for your pleasure. See, anything for God, be like using the altar, burn a burn office for a barbecue pit, you know. Uh -huh, yeah. These men drank wine out of these uh, vessels and anoint themselves with chief ointments, chief ointments. Some versions say the best ointments are the finest oils or the finest lotions or the fragrant lotions or the cheap perfumes. I think a lot of those, they miss the point. I think these were the ointments associated with the tabernacle. You read about them in Exodus 30, verses 23 through 35. They were very fragrant, very sweet. They were used to anoint things, used to burn in the lamps, special anointing oil. <clears throat> It was made after the art of a apothecary. That'd be a pharmacist. And here's what it says about it in Exodus 30, 22, 30, 32. Upon man's flesh shall it not be poured. Don't take this holy oil for God's service and pour it on man's flesh. Neither shall you make any other like it. Don't be... Don't use this recipe right. for home oil. Amen. See, people can't think of God actually saying something like this, but that's what he said. Right. Don't do it. Don't make it for yourself. It is holy, and it shall be holy unto you. When you think of this, fragrant, this unusually fragrant oil, I think this is the oil that they used uh, to anoint themselves. Make themselves smell really good. Now notice the hypocrisy of the people here. While they're drinking from sacred vessels, wine to their own satisfaction, and while they have the chief ointment, the chief ointments are put on them, they're singing these contrived songs to God. Now, God does take note of those who are concerned for the house of Israel. Notice these last words that he says to them. There were, in other words, there, Israel's religious service smelled really good to men, but it stank to God. That was the picture. And he says, now you do all this, but you're not grieved for the affliction of Joseph. Other versions say you're not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. For the ruin of Joseph, they care nothing. They have been, they have not been pained for the breach of Joseph, caring nothing at all that your brothers need your help. The ru you don't care about the ruin of your nation. It doesn't even bother you that Joseph's family is being destroyed, and you're not grieved it's, and sick at heart over the affliction and ruin of Joseph. Joseph is Israel. It's the name, name for Israel that highlighted they were precious in God's sight and especially loved, see. Mm -hmm. See, God takes note of those that aren't concerned about the problems Amen. That's right. that exist with his people. The people addressed by Amos confirm that sin does make people selfish. So that they forget their connection with God. The nation of Israel was sinking down, provoking the Lord to anger, and yet throwing in his face pretentious religion. Well, let's uh, 
make a painful application of this. <laughs> Today, there's a segment of professing Christendom that's concerned about the decline of our country. Though they quote to us often, if my people call by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, I will forgive, you know. They're concerned about the deterioration of our country or our nation. Others are grieved over the deterioration of the family structure. And so they talk about it and they raise up various ministries to restore the family to its proper place and their deep concern is for the family. I'm not condemning these things. I'm just saying this is too low. Yes. Mm -hmm. This is too low to capture your heart. Yes. Yes. Other people, they are concerned about the descent into adultery and sodomy that's in social social fabric. But what are those things in comparison to a dead church? Yeah, that's right. Or in comparison to feigned faith mm -hmm. or false teaching mm -hmm. or lukewarmness mm -hmm. or the profanation of the name of God? What are those things to compare with that? Why aren't there people lamenting the condition of the church, but crying over the condition of the country, and the family, and the government, and society in general? Are we not concerned about those things? Yes, we are, but it's, it's down a lower, a lower strata. We are preeminently concerned about the falling away of the church because it and it alone is the pillar and ground of the truth. Amen. If the church is not revived, nothing else is going to be done. That's, right. That's the means God has chosen. So when we come in, when I, when we come in to churches or exposed to churches or whether it's our own, mm -hmm. if it's dead and lifeless and people aren't involved, this is sackcloth and ashes time because God's not going to put up with this. He's given the church a lot more than he gave Israel. And for it to decline into a state of not caring and looking forward to the next trip to Branson and stuff like this, you say, are you against that? Almost. I'm not going to condemn anybody, but I'm. if someone from my family chooses it, I'll, I'll get right on it. Because <laughs> that's not... This is not a time to be thinking about what's fun and what's pleasurable. I'm not saying you don't have any pleasure. Don't get me wrong. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that should be lower on your list of priorities. That should be after you've addressed some of these other issues with the Lord. I'm talking about with the Lord. When you read about the early church, so we've got a record, Book of Acts, we've got a record of the epistles. Was anyone in the book of Acts or in any epistle, was there ever a word said about concern for a certain country? You tell me, was there? Was there? See, well, the prophets did. We're talking about the church now. Or was there a particular city that an apostle had a particular burden for a city? Were, who were the epistles written to? They're written to the churches. Because that's where God works through his people. Amen. If his people are weak, God's not going to work like we want him to work. It's not going to happen. So we have duplicated this same situation that existed in Israel. This same situation has been duplicated today. And God's still very intolerant of it. I know that these things weren't, aren't pleasant to talk about, but it wasn't pleasant for these prophets to talk about either. They didn't like go home happy because they were able to say these things. Right. They were grieved. Jeremiah said it was his water, eyes were like rivers of water. Yeah. They would pour out, mm -hmm. broke his heart that these conditions were found, that there was very few, were very few people you could turn to uh -huh. to receive some comfort in the Lord. 
There's a lot of people now, I find, there's a lot of people that are open to being comforted. And I feel we should comfort them. But when you're looking for a comforter, that's another story. They aren't quite as plentiful. Huh? Or have you found it to be so? That's a condition to mourn over. Because God says, comfort ye, comfort ye, comfort ye, my people. So there should be, you should be able, wherever you are, unless you're like on the Isle of Patmos or something like that, you should be able to find somebody, some kindred spirit that can lift you up. There's lifting up to be done. You should be, if you're like Paul, be able to stop off on the way to Rome and some brethren meet you and yeah. encourage you. But if the church is in a condition where that's not common and can't be done, well, we need to really be concerned about that. Amen. Because God won't long. We can't put this off. Yeah. Uh -huh. put, put, put away the day uh -huh. and God's going to judge us and put just act like uh -huh. we, God just wants us to get used to this. And no, he doesn't want us to get used to this. Yeah, that's right. uh -huh. All right, that's all I'm going to say on that. <laughs> yes, Brother Judah? you were speaking of <coughs> luxury can cause you to put your guard down thought that if you're satisfied with what God gives and he will give you more if you're content with yeah, what he gives right. you he will give you more if a person is in it only for say physical niceties or just plain um, personal advantages then the supply is going to be cut yeah. off yeah. but if you, if, you, if you know that God will give you grace to make do with what he gives you You'll be seen as trustworthy, a trustworthy steward, and you will get more because you showed yourself to be wise with the handling of what God gives you. Amen. Remember, I wear part of the gospel armor is to pray for all saints everywhere. This, <laughs> this is why. Amen. Yes, Brother Jason. Yeah, so on, a, on a practical note, the, there are there are people that that see the. The fact that the church is, oh, yeah. is in a decline, a declining state. Mm -hmm. I think my own opinion is that the, pro the problem that a lot of people have is they don't know how to articulate what they see. Mm -hmm. And they don't know what to do about it. Mm -hmm. and, and if you study church history, you'll study that there, you'll see that there are people all through church history yeah. that, that knew that there was something wrong with, with the predominant church. And they handled it in different ways. So Luther was going to try to reform the church, but like the church was going to kill him for doing yeah. it. And so Protestantism broke away from the Catholic Church. There have been other groups that have said, we're going, to, we're going to break away, we're going to do our own thing, we're just going to separate ourselves. Mm -hmm. Some people try to reform it, which, by the way, has never been very successful. No, never been a Reformation movement work. Yeah. And, and, you know, the... A lot of us here come out of a group called the Restoration Movement, which in a sense was another effort to try to reform Protestantism. Now, Protestantism had become divided and false doctrine being yeah. taught. And they, they said, well, we're just going to establish our own group. But you'll notice every, every time a group, every time there's a group that splits away, so we're going to do something ourselves, a lot, what, a, lot of, a lot of times what happens, the first generation has some